All right, well, um, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon with um, some colleagues I've worked with for, uh, for many years. Uh, during the first round of negotiations, I remember uh, watching Peggy work on this process and sort of getting second and third hand uh, stories about it, having no idea that I should have been play paying much closer attention because I'd be involved in the second round. <laughs> and uh, I think it's kind of ironic that uh, um, for both uh, Alex and myself, um, you have to be careful what you negotiate because both of us subsequently moved from the international office to the program office and actually have to implement what it is that we all signed up to. Well, a lot of things changed uh, in those intervening years after the signature of those original agreements uh, that the first panel talked about. Uh, the Soviet Union was dissolved and uh, Russia emerged. Uh, some of our partner contributions, you heard Freddie talk about uh, the desire for autonomy and those original agreements had things in them like uh, polar platforms and Army space plane and uh, man-tended free flyer that were no longer being pursued. It was kind of an eye-opener for me to read the agreement uh, the first time and see what all was in there and look at what program I actually had to, to, uh, to start with. Uh, and so one of the first things we had to do was um, get a new baseline agreement uh, among the original partnership to work from uh, with our Russian colleagues. Uh, and also uh, we had a, a new administration coming in in the United States uh, with uh, some budget pressures and a desire to uh, find ways to, uh, to cut costs in NASA. So those political changes more broadly in the world um, and, uh, and those budget pressures uh, and other activities all combined uh, to result in an invitation to Russia to, uh, to join this partnership. So we're going to explore a little bit uh, some different aspects of, uh, of that partnership and how thinking in the partnership evolved. So Alex, I'm going to start with you. Um, here you were in Russia with an operating space station called Mir. And along comes this partnership inviting you to join our program. So tell us a little bit about what was Russia's objective in joining into this partnership? Well, thank you, Lynn, for this question. I believe it is very appropriate to remember these times when we started discussions on the for international project. Because uh, listening carefully to the first panel, I all of a sudden I recollected the times when we started first, uh, first discussions with our partners and I got myself on the, my own, on the idea that we actually had to renegotiate what was achieved by our predecessors on the Freedom Program because we were talking about the different scope of partnership. Russia came uh, at the time when the absolutely right of the Soviet Union just fell apart and uh, the whole cooperative efforts uh, among Soviet Union and the United States and other Western nations were very limited, limited to the science in mostly in the medical biological sphere. The only major accomplishment in the human space flight was uh, Soviet support and uh, when we were considering what we can contribute, that was a dilemma. And uh, a lot of arguments, uh, listening to Peggy, uh, the arguments in the administration, the same talking uh, in Russia, because uh, the way of thinking was uh, mostly from the old days. Hey, we, we need to proceed with the national program. We do have something to say in space, because we do have a competition. Uh, we, we had uh, our Mir space station in orbit. We had plans to further develop and to actually supersede it by the new generation Mir 2. And we were actually uh, in, a, in a position to make a de determination what path to choose. Whether the wisdom having the international partnership within the international project which we now we have, unique project on orbit, International Space Station, will be the best way to achieve goals of the space exploration for my country. 
or to go the old-fashioned way to for to perform a national pure national program with international participation as we had it on the solid space stations on the Mir space station as well and the first uh, for first idea actually won the minds in the government and first first of all in the agency the Russian Space Agency was uh, established in the 1992, the same year I joined it, and uh, next year, 1993, we started discussions with uh, U.S. government in a broader sense on the variety of issues, including our, our human space flight. It was on agenda on the, in a parallel efforts with the commercial endeavors on the commercial space launchers or how the market will evolve and the technology transfers. The human space flight was an agenda on, from the first, uh, first days. And then this difficult process of six years. Differ difficult and interesting because we eventually we rewrote in many instances agreement, uh, IGA and MOU uh, MOU with Russia for, for Roscosmos and NASA, it was brand new, it was no pre-existing document, uh, therefore it took uh, quite an effort. And the m major, uh, I believe, victory we, we held that uh, through the precursor program of the uh, called uh, Shuttle Mir, when we accomplished uh, absolutely amazing things when the huge object is like a space shuttle, first time docked to the space station, and we started discussions on that, the first question on the Russian side was, hey, if space shuttle will ruin our space station, who will blame for it? And that was a question from the cosmonaut, from Valery Rumin, who was sitting in a chair and said, hey, I need to understand, I am a, for, for, and he, at that time he was a, for, a space flight director in uh, Russian soup, because uh, shuttle was in active mode and the station naturally in a passive mode, and that's, uh, if that will be a rough docking, then we will have a problem. And we spent, I believe, several days talking about this, uh, jumping into the liability problem from the technical aspects. Today, we do not have such a problems, and that's a great accomplishment. Absolutely true that the great accomplishment is a trust which we built among the uh, technical societies, uh, scientific societies, on the grounds of different technical cultures, engineering cultures, first of all, different standards which we applied in the space uh, area. We merged them, we, I believe we took best things from each other and converged into the uh, uh, comprehensive integrated space station program which we have today. Well, hearing, hearing everyone talk about the number of meetings that we had to uh, try and agree on all these things reminds me of a comment that was made by um, one of my former bosses and Peggy's too, uh, Ken Pedersen. Um, he was particularly frustrated at one point, and he said, I know what the design of the space station is going to be. It's going to be a huge conference room. Well, as Alex said, uh, it was kind of a renegotiation, although I think in the minds of the original partners, perhaps we didn't expect it to be quite such an extensive transformation. And I recall an early meeting where we put together um, an, a list of ideas of what changes should be made to the agreement in bringing Russia in. Um, it was called the minimalist approach at the time. Um, and uh, as Alex uh, suggested, uh, Russia had some uh, rather strong opinions, shall we say, about the nature of the partnership and what they needed. Uh, and once the door was opened, um, Europe walked through too. So, uh, Pepe, you want to tell us a little bit about the evolution in uh, Europe's thinking? Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I, I would like to point out that, uh, as it has pointed, uh, been pointed out by several speakers before, <clears throat> when you have the real thing, it works, and you unavoidably agree and make it work. The different spirit is when you have to negotiate with a, for a non-existing space station, and you have to figure out all the 
various cases. And I would like to say uh, there is a psychological aspect that I would like to mention. Uh, mind you, I started my career with the Dono Space Age. I am a slide rule engineer to start with. And I remember the first day I <clears throat> had a meeting with NASA in NASA headquarters. I saw for the first time, you know, the, the how do you say, projection from the back of, uh, of uh, and it was magic because we used the, the blackboard still. So it's a long way. And uh, although you have heard uh, that uh, all the negotiation of the first MOU, in which I was uh, a member of the negotiating team, uh, aimed for a genuine partnership, and indeed it was a genuine partnership, and so on and so forth, unavoidably, at least the way I felt and what you could read into the wording, Europe and ESA was somehow a junior partner. You cannot avoid. And to give you an example, for instance, it said that uh, decision will be made by consensus, of course, because we are genuine partners. But if consensus cannot be reached, NASA will take the decision. And it was there. Now here comes Russia with a flying and working space station. I say, hey, what do you mean NASA takes a decision? <laughs> and so that opened the door, as, uh, as Lynn said, to renegotiate the MOU and the IGA. And uh, Europe was uh, in a non-easy position because, of course, we wanted to play loyal partner of NASA, we were the founding fathers, or among the founding fathers of this endeavor. And yet, uh, Alexei opened the door for trying to make it uh, some more, more genuine, <laughs> the partnership. I don't remember exactly how we worked out the decision part time, but certainly NASA and, uh, and uh, Rosalia Cosmos, as it was, at the time opened the door to a more genuine partnership. The end was that we renegotiated from top to bottom and uh, apparently, as everybody says, it works. Okay. Um, another key area that we had, had to talk about, uh, since after all the, the point of building the station is to use it, is what, uh, what our operations and utilization concept would be um, and there was a concept that was put together in the original um, agreements, uh, and uh, it was not one that, uh, that Russia agreed with entirely, and we went through several iterations. Um, so I'm going to ask Heinz, who works a lot in this field, to talk a little bit about uh, ops and utilization concept, and then um, kind of how it all works now that we're really up there. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Um, the the uh, uh, first round of negotiators uh, bequeathed us a, uh, a complex uh, uh, structure of, uh, of planning at uh, three levels. Uh, you saw Bill Gerstenmeier's uh, chart of the operations uh, centers spread globally. Lay on top of that the, the program offices and, uh, and management organizations and technical organizations of each of the partners. You have a, a huge, a hugely complex uh, set of management interfaces, and the first, uh, the founding fathers uh, attempted to simplify this by uh, creating three layers of uh, of planning: uh, strategic, tactical, and execution. And then they uh, they tra they separated uh, activities into utilization activities and uh, and operations activities, and established uh, uh, forums which. Uh, I believe were intended to uh, introduce a creative uh, tension between the uh, the two, so that uh, where the operators always wanted uh, everything, so uh, so that everything could be perfect and uh, everything would be backed up. And but 
there wouldn't be any resources left to use the station uh, for, uh, for research or, or whatever anybody wanted. So that tension between operators and users, uh, we, we had to work through. Uh, we're, we're still dealing with, uh, with that because obviously the safety of the, uh, the crew on board and the, uh, the vehicle itself uh, is, uh, is paramount. Uh, utilization takes place in the, uh, in the margins. Um, this uh, elaborate, uh, elaborate structure uh, uh, it was also intended to balance everybody's national aspirations with, uh, with the need for a, a central coordinating activity. So you had long debates about how many, much of the activity would be distributed to the, uh, the other partners and how much of it was uh, integrated within, within NASA and uh, how much oversight uh, NASA would have of, of everybody's activities. Uh, we then along came, uh, came the invitation to Russia and you had a, uh, an existing uh, space station program, an active uh, program, uh, most of, uh, and uh, the world really changed, I, th I think, and uh, we saw that from the, the sidelines. Um, we got uh, uh, some visibility from our, our NASA colleagues into what was going on. But basically, uh, the station started operating as, uh, as a Russian segment, and in one document it's called the American segment, uh, because there wasn't enough recognition of the, uh, uh, the American clients, uh, Europe, Japan, and, uh, and Canada. Um, we're still experiencing that. Uh, I, there are people out, uh, who came with me who are much better uh, versed in, the, uh, in how the operations work. But as far as utilization goes, it seems as though there's, very, uh, there's an entirely separate Russian planning system and, and U.S. planning system. Uh, this, this has not hindered us significantly. We, uh, Europe particularly, I know Japan, uh, Canada uh, have uh, ar arrangements with, uh, with our Russian colleagues for cooperation, for uh, contracting uh, for, for uh, services. Canada's reaching out in that uh, direction as well. In fact, that, uh, in spite of a fairly rigid uh, sh uh, structure for sharing the resources and accommodations on board the space station, uh, what has grown up has been, uh, become a very collaborative and very complex uh, again, complexity, uh, a very complex uh, set of relationships related to uh, helping each other out uh, to, e to mutual benefit. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Well, Jim Zimmerman, in his opening remarks, mentioned um, in his list of attributes for space station participants, patience. Um, and um, one might call Japan our most patient partner. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that uh, while uh, uh, the rest of us over time changed the nature of our contribution, we had a new partner come in with Russia, Japan was steadfast throughout um, with a laboratory concept that continues today um, and two of the three um, elements of that are now on orbit. Um, so I think the rest of us could maybe learn some lessons from Japan on how you sustained it through um, all the trials and tribulations of the rest of us. Yoshi? I think the, I mean, uh, conservative is a kind of the culture of the Japan. And uh, uh, I think the, we were the most conservative partner at that time and when the Russian and uh, Korean joined. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the, it was 1994, we already spent 10 years without any outcome. And uh, it is not a uh, good uh, political situation in Japan. And no uh, enthusiastic support from the politicians to continue the space station program. So in that situation, what's happened? We reconsider the, all the scheme and the design uh, it cannot stop the uh, downsizing of the space station. Even uh, we have fear about to, I mean, continue the, our space station program. And also, we already uh, contracted out our total I mean, development cost, half of the total 
uh, development cost, and uh, we would like we chose uh, is the uh, best way not to change any design, and hopefully uh, to keep the all international uh, agreement, especially the share of the common operation costs. Of course, uh, we welcome the. Uh, to increase the robustness uh, because of the Russian participation, and uh, we hope the reduction of the common pressure cost. That is our situation. I'm going to um, give my colleagues here uh, a little bit of uh, time to uh, uh, reminisce, maybe from a personal perspective, um, and ask each of them to share either their favorite moment in this program, or um, maybe something that surprised them. How, how have their expectations changed over the course of the program? So uh, let me go back through. Alex, you want to start us off? Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I'm afraid I can use a lot of time recalling many instances through the, uh, actually, my uh, 16 years in the program, starting from the uh, first round of negotiations, and, the, uh, and today I'm uh, head of IS, Russian ISS program. Uh, I believe that uh, the transition of, uh, of expectations or for transformation, rather, of expectation happened uh, not quickly, especially on our side, because. Uh, well, Again, the space is a uh, is a is a good mixture of uh, of um, policy matters, politics, and uh, and technology. And uh, the decisions which we were taking, especially uh, for example, through the time when we were negotiating the Mir shuttle program, uh, when NASA invited us in a bunker. Which is the for secure facility in the Johnson Space Center, uh, remote, uh, remotely uh, lo located from the uh, main buildings, which is the half under the uh, underground, with the signs on the on the on the door. No, no for classified discussions beyond this door when you enter in the men's room. Uh, that's. <laughs> And we were spending uh, there quite a time having the Russian segment and U.S. segment already in this bunker because there were big teams involved and the specialists who were, who were talking about the science program operations, legal matters. And that was quite a training, I would tell us. Um, then we for transition to IGA negotiations when we uh, introduced this idea which was not welcome from the very, very first time that hey, are we talking about the International Space Station or we are talking about the national uh, program with international participation which is a different uh, uh, aspect. Uh, and different uh, meaning for, at least for us, I believe, in the for all partners eventually, which we evolve through the discussions, and we do have international uh, uh, space station program uh, today, and it's very important that we get it uh, in the United Nations uh, premises today, and talking about this program. Uh, again, the uh, Criminal jurisdiction, the, I, I will fully agree with uh, Mark Evans, and uh, that's the uh, well, clue game. That's modeling what will happen if. And that's exactly what was happening, that the, the modeling was uh, for every, every hour, every day, what will happen if, because very many unknown situations were uh, theoretically envisaged. How we will operate with the two uh, prime uh, mission control centers on the first stage. How they will interact? Who will be in charge? And it's very logical that the one vehicle, even integrated vehicle as ISS, should uh, have a, a, a kind of a leader which will define the overall operation. That's the for NASA role, which uh, we agreed as a basic uh, principle that uh, NASA role for integration and coordination for the program 
will be for very well uh, clearly assigned within the uh, legal framework. And then those discussions which we, we, we held uh, well, give us a lot of experience, I believe, uh, in knowledge. How to interact, how to understand each other. And what we accomplished through the different times when the uh, delays with the hardware, the tragedy with Columbia when we were flying in a limited crew, only two people were flying to orbit, when we suspended actually assembly. Uh, three years behind, uh, when we were uh, considering that we will assemble space station within five years for a time frame and we will operate for another 10 years. Today, we are planning to complete it in 2010. And just this year, we, with the whole partnership, it was just a giant leap forward with the assembly, having the uh, 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 huge contributions of our partners on orbit. And it's a logical thing which I believe and hope that we will discuss next week during HOA here in Paris. What we will ask us ourselves and our governments to do with this program beyond 2015. And it's, I believe, very logical to expect that this project shall survive longer than we anticipated in the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Heinz, your turn. Lynn, you've, uh, you've asked us to cast our minds back. Uh, uh, I think there's, there's three things trying to come out simultaneously, so you'll have to excuse me. Uh, there's a lesson to be learned. When we embarked on the, uh, what became the Freedom Program, there were a number of, uh, of features uh, in it which don't uh, appear in the current uh, space station. Things like uh, solar dynamic uh, arrays, things like a, uh, a crew rescue vehicle. Uh, it, had a, it had a crew of eight uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, the lab, uh, US lab was twice as long. The Columbus lab was considerably longer. We had the polar platforms. We had the, uh, the man-tended free flyer. The polar platforms were intended to, uh, to be serviced by shuttles from, uh, from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, I, I actually visited that facility once. Uh, it, it became, it was mothballed very, uh, very quickly when, it, when we discovered the shuttle didn't have significant payload capability to that orbit. Um, we had, uh, I could go on. We had fi uh, one of the key points was that, that we had the expectation of five shuttle flights uh, a year, with 40% of uh, the cargo capacity uh, being utilization hardware, payloads, uh, research equipment. Um, it, that's tons, that's huge. So that's what we went in thinking uh, we, were, we were getting. What we have now is a, is a facility. Somebody has, has uh, um, uh, handed us lemons, you could say, if you were negative, and we are making excellent lemonade. Just excellent lemonade. Uh, we... Uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, f feel too badly about those things that we lost along the way. Uh, we all have to understand uh, each, each other's national uh, processes for, for funding. But to me, that's a lesson. And it's a lesson that, uh, or it, it's a, uh, a grid which we should place over uh, the promises or the, the expectations of uh, a subsequent uh, um, uh, partnership which we might be invited into. Thank you. Thanks. Yoshi? Yeah, uh, for me, uh, it is most astonishing part of the program is the, to establish the, I mean, the relationship the, of the, any, uh, many levels. I think the uh, first time we, I mean, our heads gathered for the program was the, I mean, the second time to the negotiation. I think that after that, uh, we hold HOA the, almost every year, and the, but anyway, something happened. The heads of each agency gathered and discussed the results. And that kind of the relationship established a huge difference before, I mean, uh, when we start the, uh, the space station program, the, 
they rarely get together. And uh, sometimes only the signing ceremony or the just a courtesy purpose or something like that. But uh, after the second set of the negotiation, they often, I mean, uh, more, almost the, uh, I mean, uh, periodically meet together and uh, discuss the, what the next, that uh, is our most astonishing part of this program. Okay, Pepe. Lynn, I would like to, to give you some hints about uh, I would not even call them lessons learned, but uh, things that I like to remember. Uh, for instance, uh, when we started the negotiation with Russia, uh, we faced uh, a totally different aspect that we never uh, explored so deeply. That was the business-like. Uh, I mean, uh, bring, keep what you bring, uh, uh, pay for what crosses the interface, but no exchange of funds, uh, so paying services, uh, so, so go for launches, uh, but how can you compare economies, because the shuttle cannot be compared to Ariane, uh, even less to Soyuz, so we had to invent a new currency, the APMAS, whatever they mean to bring it up, uh, is uh, APMAS and period. Or when <clears throat> I met, uh, for instance, the the very peculiar figure of the general designer. You would never see, or almost never see, in the Western culture, a general designer, a CEO, that can bring you through the shuttle, to say, and knowing the shuttle inside out. But a Russian general designer led us through Mir, the mock-up on the ground, and knew everything, every bolt and nut of the... So that was something that all the culture uh, of which you have seen a, <clears throat> an aspect uh, in the repair of the solar array. Uh, NASA and Western culture in terms of uh, engineering was uh, fail-safe. Uh, the aircraft, uh, the aviation approach. Whereas uh, somebody qualified the Russian approach as a Navy approach, you repair on board. And uh, that was uh, all extremely interesting in this negotiation because it had impact also in the way you worded and, and prospected the things. But I would like to remember something that has to do with our Japanese friends. Japanese friends uh, that we learn very soon to listen very carefully when they had uh, some uh, remark during the negotiation because, because uh, their effort to translate from their language or in their language, they were watching commas, uh, semicolons, and or ors, and you all of a sudden uh, found out that something had escaped to your attention. So we, we learned to listen very carefully to what our Japanese friend brought to the table. And still, I would like to be casual and uh, candid and remember that uh, one day in Tokyo, our friend and uh, head negotiator, Otsuka, invited all of us to a hot spring toward the Fujiyama. You know, there is a, a dress code in negotiation. You have your tie, your... and behind your dress you keep uh, your negotiation position, uh, your identity, you represent, uh, in the case of Europe, uh, 15 member states, 15 participating member states. And all of a sudden, of course, the ladies in a different pool, you find yourself with all the others, with all your negotiating counterparts, like Mother Nature, Nature made you. <laughs> All the dress code is gone, and you are, you know, a school or a herd or a pack of humans trying to work together. And I can tell you that was quite an experience and certainly a contribution to the spirit that uh, still 
survives and keeps going in the space station cooperation. Yes, well, that, that is a, um, a fun memory for me, too, um, because it, it suddenly brought home uh, to me personally the gender difference in our delegations, um, because in the female Japanese bath, it was me and Melanie Saunders from Johnson Space Center. The entire Canadian, European, Japanese, and majority of American delegation were all in the men's bath. Um, I, I'd like to wrap up by saying that um, I think for me, um, I certainly have uh, lots of memories of different points in the negotiations and positions we took and so on, um, but I agree with, with Pepe, one of the uh, one of the things that, that uh, is, my, is really what is my strongest memory is uh, the personal relationships that we built over the years. Uh, the only way you can uh, have successful negotiations, I think, is to get to know one another, to understand um, uh, our common interests, but also understand our differences, um, to be able to, uh, to speak frankly and build those trusts uh, so that uh, in the tough times when you have to make difficult decisions or when you're really pressed um, because of some uh, domestic issue at home, you can explain it, your partners will understand it, and you can find a common way forward. And I think that is a wonderful legacy for the program and something for all of us to build on uh, as we go to the future. Thank you.